All right, well, thank you all for joining us tonight. My name is Kevin Ring and I am president of FAM. Uh, let me start by saying how grateful we are for the incredible feedback we've received so far for the Vanishing Trial. Um, this documentary was more than a year in the making and I really couldn't be prouder that a documentary of this quality was written, produced and edited completely in-house. And for that, I am very happy to give credit to our producer, Wynette Yao, our cinematographer and editor, Travis Edwards, and our vice president of communications, Rabia Burks. I'm also very grateful to our longtime partners at NACD, NACDL um, for joining us in this and supporting this project. If you saw the movie, you will know that I have more than an academic interest in this topic. Uh, and I hope this documentary helps others become interested and motivated to take action without having to go through a similar ordeal themselves. And in fact, my dream is that so many people will see this um, that we will rival law and order um, because nothing has done more to distort our country's view of the criminal justice system than that show. Think about it. Uh, every episode of Law and Order begins with a crime and an arrest and ends in a trial. Yet if that show were based in reality, you'd have to have a hundred episodes to find three that ended in a trial. Those are the statistics. Punitive, politician drafted, mandatory minimum sentences in the hands of zealous and unchecked prosecutors have led to the near extinction of one of the most fundamental rights we have as citizens, the right to a jury trial. At FAM, we know that behind the statistics about how few people go to trial and behind the serious but abstract arguments about how these laws are damaging our system of checks and balances are real people real people whose lives are being destroyed by a process that barely pretends to care about whether justice is being done. We meet tonight at a time when the inequities of our justice system are being laid bare. As with other problems, the trial penalty causes harm to all Americans, but it hits some groups harder than others. We know, for example, that black Americans are more likely to get worse plea offers, and as a result, to reject those offers and then get saddled with longer prison sentences. Just think about Chris Young's case from the movie. His first plea offer was 14 years. 14 years for a crime that Judge Sharp said, for, for a role that Judge Sharp said was just minor in a drug crime. We have to do better than that. Eliminating unjust trial penalties and re restoring our constitutional right to trial won't be easy, but we can do it. We first need to make sure that people who haven't been through this system are aware of this problem. And that's our goal for the Vanishing Project. I urge everyone watching tonight to share it with your friends, your family and your networks, and then get involved. And the simplest way you can get involved is by joining FAM. And so I'll ask you right now, pick up your phone and please text FAM to 21333. That's FAM, F-A-M-M -M, to 21333. We have to build an army of dedicated advocates to changing these laws. So thank you for joining us. Now I have the honor of introducing our esteemed panel. First is Brittany Barnett. She's an award-winning attorney and founder of a series of nonprofit groups, including the Buried Alive Project. She spends most of her days trying to free people from unjust life sentences, either through the courts or through executive clemency. It's not a bad way, not a bad way to spend your life. She's also the author of the forthcoming memoir, A Knock at Midnight, A Story of Hope, Justice, and Freedom. We are incredibly grateful to Brittany, not only for making time tonight, but making time to tell Chris's story uh, for the film. She does an incredible job of explaining how outrageous that case is. Sakira Cook is the director of the Justice Reform Programs at the Leadership Conference on Civil and Human Rights. In that position, she leads the development of the program's policy agenda, which seeks to advance solutions that eliminate structural inequity, racism, and injustice at every stage of the criminal justice system, from policing to sentencing to reentry. And we're grateful to have her here with us. Clark Neely is vice president for criminal justice at the Cato Institute. No one, and I mean no one, drawing breath on the planet has done more in the past couple of years to call attention to the problems caused by unchecked prosecutorial power than Clark Neely. He was against qualified immunity before it was cool, his criticism of the justice system is often understated and subtle. For example, his latest blog post is titled, America's criminal justice system is rotten to the core. We wish Clark would stop mincing words. 
Last but not least is our moderator and a great friend and partner to FAM. Norman Reamer is the Executive Director of the National Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers. At NACDL, and before that as a practicing defense lawyer, Norman saw firsthand how coercive plea bargaining and the trial penalty undermined the administration of justice. At his direction, NACDL nearly two years ago published the seminal report on the trial penalty, a report that both clearly outlined the problem and made numerous recommendations to fix it. I wanna mention one other thing. In addition to partnering on this project, FAM and NACDL are working right now to provide counsel to people in federal prison who are at risk of COVID-19 and seeking compassionate release. As of today, we have been able to match nearly 1,100 prisoners and their families with free competent counsel. Thank you, Norman, for your partnership, your support of this project, and for all you do uh, in this space. And I turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Kevin, for that really great introduction and uh, for your fortitude. And thank you to you and all of your colleagues at FAM uh, for putting together this fabulous documentary uh, and helping to bring to life uh, the problem that uh, we've been working on at NACDL, which is the trial penalty. So first, let me say good evening to those of you who are in the East, good afternoon to those of you who are in the West, um, and welcome to what I know will be a fascinating discussion about the vanishing trial. Um, we presume that many, if not most of you have seen it. Um, we know that in just the few days of this uh, sort of pre-release, private release, it's been viewed by uh, more than 1,100 viewers. Um, the four vignettes in the film are true stories. These are real people who have suffered real consequences and are in some cases still suffering them. Um, three of them suffered the crushing blow of the trial penalty for the mere act, the mere act of asserting a fundamental constitutional right, the right to go to trial, the right to have a jury of one's peers decide whether or not a person is guilty or innocent. Uh, as Kevin mentioned, he's the fourth. His story shows the enormous pressure brought to bear, the coercive, terrifying prospect of losing everything. Um, he did avoid the worst impacts, but that was partly because of his own fortitude, that he had the resources to fight, partly because he had excellent lawyers, and partly because he benefited from a reform that can help to stem the problem. Uh, and we're gonna talk about that later in the, uh, in the program. Uh, two of those who were, who were in the film, uh, Eric Wyant and Brittany's client, Chris Young, are still behind bars paying the price for exercising this fundamental right. So as we get into this discussion, let me just set the stage. Uh, as Kevin said, 97 to 98% of criminal cases are resolved in this country without a trial, mostly by a guilty plea. The fact is that in some courts and in some places in this country, 100% of cases are resolved by guilty pleas. There is no trial at all. Uh, and there are so many reasons why this is so. But, but the, the question that we have to ask is, if the trial right is a fundamental right, why do so many people readily give it up? And so many other rights besides the right to a trial, why are they, why are they willing to give it up? And the answer, of course, is the bludgeon of the trial penalty. It's the threat that if you assert your rights at each and every stage of the process, the cost can go up for you. So that you wind up in a situation where even, even if you believe that you are innocent, even if you are innocent, a rational person will make a decision that rather than risk a life sentence or 20 years, it's better to take a two year sentence or a one year sentence or a three year sentence. This is Justice, this is what justice has become in America. And as Kevin alluded, and as we're gonna get into in the details, it falls most heavily on those who are poor, communities of color, places where there's over-policing. We're gonna hear that right off the bat as I turn to Brittany. Uh, Brittany, you represented Chris Young. He was offered uh, either 12 or 14 years before trial, but then he went to trial and he got life. He got life because of sentencing enhancements. I'd like you to do two things. I'd like you to explain what sentencing enhancements are, and then I'd like you to explain why they disproportionately impact communities of color. Sure, so as you said, Chris Young, who's now 32 years old, was arrested at the age of 22. 
and ultimately given a fundamental death sentence. His sentence was enhanced under a statute, federal statute called, that we call 851 enhancement. So that means Chris Young had prior drug felonies that prosecutors were able to use to enhance his sentence. And at the time, the law was, if you had one prior felony, it was a mandatory minimum increase up to 20 years. Two prior drug felonies, the mandatory minimum significantly increased to life. Those two prior drug felonies in the federal level could have been 50 years ago, could have been less than an ounce of crack. There were no limitations at all based to use those priors. And that was part of the problem as well. And so it is definitely a statutory law that gives pro federal prosecutors sole discretion, which means once the federal prosecutor decides that an 851 enhancement is appropriate in the case, there is absolutely nothing a federal judge can do. There are absolutely no arguments the defense can put forth. The prosecutor has sole unfeathered power. And so with the sentencing enhancements, they are disproportionately impacting people of color, black people in particular, because one of the reasons is black communities are heavily policed. And so black residents are getting prior drug convictions in situations where drugs are being consumed at the same rate in other communities. For example, in Chris Young's case, his first prior, he was 18 years old for six grams of crack. He received probation, no prison time. His second prior, he was 19 years old for less than 0.5 grams of crack. Crumbs, literally crumbs in the floorboard of a car, I'm not kidding. He received probation again, no prison time. Yet and still, once he decided to utilize his constitutional right to go to trial, the prosecutor decided to reach back to those teenage convictions where no prison time was inserted. Literally the quantity for his prior offenses was less than three pennies. Both priors, the crack involved weighed less than three pennies. And this quantity, these priors enable the prosecution to literally seek a fundamental death sentence for Chris Young. And, and we really don't know whether the circumstances under which he was convicted of those prior very minor, very minimal possessions, uh, possession of drugs were the result of unlawful searches, right? Um, exactly, they were both from traffic stops. And we, you're absolutely right. We don't know if they were from unlawful searches. So it may very well have been, I don't know if you know for, for sure, but it may very well have been that, you know, he was facing a situation on those cases where if he didn't plead guilty, he might've had to sit in jail, wait for a lawyer, uh, have bail set that he couldn't make. And so just by, by giving up and pleading guilty on those cases, he set the stage then for ultimately what becomes a life sentence. Absolutely, absolutely. Those plea agreements from those prior cases definitely had some unintended consequences for Chris Young. So I've got one more uh, before I turn to one of the other panelists. I know you, a lot of your work involves uh, people who are serving life sentences. Um, what percentage of those people with those life sentences uh, are there because they went to trial and are some of those people actually less uh, blameworthy, less culpable than some of the co-defendants in their cases? Absolutely, over 90%, and we've analyzed over 30 years of data from the United States Sentencing Commission, over 90% of the people in federal prisons that are in life without parole went to trial. And many of them are in very similar situations as Chris Young. A lot of the times they are asked to cooperate, because keep in mind, the government isn't just giving plea deals in a drug case for free. They want something in exchange, they want cooperation. 
mostly. And a lot of times people at the bottom of the totem pole, they don't have the information to cooperate on the bigger fish per se. And so they have no choice sometimes but to go to trial because the plea deals are offered are so outrageous. So for Chris at 22 years old, 14 years seemed like a lifetime to him. So we've got a, we've got a perverse system where in some cases, the, the, least, the, the least involved person winds up with the greatest sentence and the people who are at the top and have the, the most, let's say to trade off, they can get the least amount. Absolutely. Um, I, I wanna turn to Sakura, uh, if I may, for a moment. Uh, Chris Wyant is the young man in the film uh, who uh, gets surrounded by some folks, tries to get away, shoots a gun in the air. Uh, nobody is, uh, nobody's killed or, or, or seriously injured. Um, he's offered three years, he goes to trial and he gets life. He got life because of a mandatory minimum. What is, what is the role, what is the, what is the function of mandatory minimums and why is it that they are such a, a, a great contributor to this trial penalty and to the evisceration of trials? Thanks, Norm, um, for that question. And thanks to both uh, FAM and NHCDL for putting together this important discussion. Um, the Leadership Conference has long um, loathed the adoption of mandatory minimums by Congress. And in mo many respects, mandatory minimums were uh, were put into place to respond to both um, during, I would say, the crack epidemic, during the war on drugs, respond to this notion that we needed to be tough, quote unquote, tough on crime and, and to have tough sentences that would help to deter drug involvement, involvement in, in drug crimes, I guess, for, for lack of a better word. Um, and they were mostly applied to both drug, drugs and guns. Um, and so Congress put in place this sentencing structure that really virtually foreclosed any judicial discretion to um, look at and evaluate the facts of an individual's case um, and look at if there were any contributing factors to what might or might not have happened during that instance. And so um, in our view, mandatory minimums have really um, been a one size fit all approach to sentencing and have undermined um, what, and what I would say is the role of uh, the courts and to evaluate, you know, um, someone's culpability to meaningfully evaluate whether what what did someone did or didn't do and how they did or didn't contribute to what the, the crime was. And they are disproportionate, right? They, they don't um, mean they aren't proportional, I think, to um, in many instances to crimes that people are charged with. Um, mandatory minimum studies have shown, the Sentencing Commission has shown that mandatory minimums also disproportionately uh, impact people of color. They are more likely to receive mandatory minimum sentences than white counterparts. In this instance, this um, young man was, was a white person uh, who exercised his, his uh, right to go to trial. And because of that, he, the judge had no choice but to give him this mandatory life sentence because of the prosecutor. So it's the prosecutor's choice to bring that particular count, that particular charge that gives the prosecutor essentially the power, not only to charge, but actually to determine the sentence. Absolutely. That seems so fundamentally uh, wrong. Absolutely, it's, it's as if judges in these cases don't matter. Um, we have fundamentally turned over accountability and, and sort of transparency in, in judicial process to prosecutors. They uh, are able to coerce pleas by hanging over long sentences, long mandatory minimums over people's heads. I mean, I think that was the case in Chris's, uh, Chris Young's instance. That was the case in this young man's instance as well, and was the case in many, I think, people who are serving um, uh, serving sentences primarily in federal prison for drugs and or gun convictions. So I want to pivot from that question and go to Clark. And I want to ask you this question, Clark. I really want to ask this. It's a question of morality. Uh, it, let's say a, a prosecutor believes that a particular sentence is appropriate. In the case of Eric, it was a three-year sentence. In the case of Chris, it was either 12 or 14 years uh, was the offer that was made. If a prosecutor believes that for, for punishment, for retribution, for deterrence, 
for the protection of public safety. That's an appropriate sentence. What is the morality of then pursuing a charge or an enhancement which results in a geometrically increased, in one case going from 12 or 14 years to life, in another case going from three years to 20 years, uh, six to seven times greater. What is the, what's the morality, what's the moral justification for this? Uh, there is none. It is completely immoral, as is our criminal justice system fundamentally. It is indefensible and immoral. Uh, the, uh, now the response will typically be, well, listen, um, what I'm doing is I'm giving you a break because what, what society uh, expressed through sentencing policy is that the sentence should have been this, but in my infinite uh, mercy, I've decided to offer you this wonderful benefit if you will spare the government the expense and inconvenience of a jury trial. Uh, and it's no matter how you dress it up, it's naked coercion and it is utterly immoral. It's completely immoral to put somebody in a position uh, where you induce them to waive such a valuable right. And think about it, is there a more valuable right in all of history uh, than the ability to have a, a group of your own fellow citizens uh, act as a shield between you and a potentially ty tyrannical government? Uh, and certainly that was the view of, uh, of the people who wrote the constitution and it reflects centuries uh, of, of uh, Anglo-American common law history. And in the space of a few short decades, we've allowed judges and prosecutors to completely hack uh, this century old uh, system in which the government uh, could not put you in a cage unless it convinced a super majority, 12 people from your community to all agree without a single reservation uh, that that was an appropriate thing to do. And it's impossible to overstate the effect that this has had uh, on the system. There is probably nothing more dangerous on the planet than a government that has learned that with the application of enough pressure, anybody can be induced to plead guilty to something. Uh, and that is where we have, where we have gotten to. Uh, prosecutors in America have learned that almost anybody can be induced to plead guilty, whether they are or are not guilty to uh, a crime. And the only question is what levers do you have to apply and how much pressure? I'll give you one example. I think one of the most appalling and disgraceful things that I learned as I became more knowledgeable about criminal justice in America is that not only is it permissible to gratuitously threaten someone's family member in order to induce a plea, it is absolutely routine uh, among prosecutors and particularly in the federal system. It's hard to imagine a more nakedly immoral and uh, a, a, a more uh, um, obnoxious violation of the rule of law than to allow prosecutors to threaten somebody's family members purely uh, to exert plea leverage. That too is immoral. And I'll end by saying this, prosecutors can't have it both ways. And they routinely do try to have it both ways. And by that, I mean this, um, either they are systematically giving away the shop by systematically giving people, offering people uh, far less of, by way of a punishment than society supposedly has prescribed, um, or it is the case that they are threatening people with nakedly unjust and immoral punishments in order to induce them to plead guilty so that they can re then receive something amounting to at least closer to a fair punishment. They can't have it both ways. They're either giving away the store or they are engaging in naked and immoral uh, coercion. And in fact, in some cases, or, or as, a, as a body, prosecutors are in fact doing both of those things sometimes. They gave away the store to Jeffrey Epstein, who is probably the most prolific serial molester in the history of this country. Um, he got a sweetheart deal that was far less than he deserved, but most people, what they get, they get uh, crucified uh, if they exercise uh, their right to a trial. The whole system is morally indefensible, and this part of it is one of the most immoral aspects of an immoral system. Well, I want to uh, I want to continue this uh, this dialogue, but I wanted to do make I want to make two observations. One is I may have misspoken. Eric got twenty years uh, with, with with an offer of three, so it was about six or seven times, uh, and it was Chris who got life. Uh, still, dramatically, dramatically uh, different from what was offered initially. And to this point about innocent pleading about the the coercion that can make even innocent people plead guilty, I do want to throw into the discussion um, that. The uh, Innocence Project uh, has indicated that 11% of the cases um, in which there has been an actual DNA exoneration, which means you know, absolute innocence, 11% of those cases involved guilty pleas. And the, uh, the National Registry uh, on Exonerations has it up somewhere up to 15 or 18%. So this problem of innocent people pleading guilty is very real. 
Uh, and I, as a trial lawyer, can attest to the fact that you are, as a lawyer, you are, you are uh, ethically obligated to lay out the risks to your client. And even a client who may tell you, look, I, I didn't do it. I really, I'm, I'm innocent. I acted in self-defense. I didn't have intent to defraud. Whatever the charge may be, you have to tell them. Here's the, it becomes almost like a, like a, like a, like a mathematical computation. You know, you have an 80% chance that you, you'll get acquitted, but you have a 100% chance if you don't, you're gonna get five times as great a sentence. And those are the decisions that people have to make uh, sometimes with small children at home, with elderly parents, uh, with their whole lives on the line. So I wanted to throw that in there, but I wanna shift back again um, for a moment to Secura because uh, what Clark is talking about, this coercive effect, and I want to talk about the effect on the system. If we are, if we are using, if we are allowing prosecutors to use this power to get people to plead guilty to avoid the penalty, and they're getting them to do it before discovery has been completed, which we know happens. If they're getting them to do it uh, by giving up motions to challenge illegally seized evidence, what is that effect on society? So the effect um, is that um, misconduct goes unchecked, right? Prosecutorial misconduct, police misconduct goes unchecked. People are essentially, defendants are essentially waiving their rights to appeal or to challenge certain legal real rulings around evidence. Um, they're essentially, you know, bargaining facts away through, through a, a plea deal, which, you know, it, these are the agreed upon facts that the judge is going to accept but isn't necessarily reflective of what may what what did or didn't happen. And it increasingly, plea bargaining increasingly, I think includes um, sort of police departments and other partners as um, the arbiters of, of pleas, right? Where um, police, it eliminates any independent check on police on bad arrests on um, you know, <laughs> on evidence that that might have been obtained incorrectly, um, and in, individuals, both the public doesn't know who those bad actors are, right? Because we won't be able to bring that to the light in during a trial. But also, uh, police are able to continue to abuse and misuse the system. And to Clark's earlier point, that's immoral, right? It it undermines the validity of the criminal legal system. It undermines anybody the trust that people may or may not have in whether the system is going to treat them fairly whether they are going to actually get equal justice under law. And that for us is hugely problematic and hugely um, immoral. Um, and as Clark says, it, it shows the fact that our system is, is fundamentally flawed, but you know, sort of corrupt <laughs> from the core <laughs> if we are giving up the store to prosecutors and to police in this manner. And in this moment, right, where we are seeing massive protests Right in response to police misconduct, to police brutality, um, it only the connection can't be made more clear. Right, the connection between this issue and the issue of police misconduct and brutality can't be made more clear for folks. And I think it's a, it's fundamental that we interrogate every piece of the system, especially as it relates to people's freedom, um, and whether or not their freedom is being given up. Well, thanks very much for that very complete answer, because I think you're talking, that really gets to the heart of how, how this is corrupting the system from the beginning to the end by, by insulating uh, misconduct that never gets litigated because they're manipulating this uh, coercive police system. We have a question from, uh, from a viewer, and I wanna, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask Brittany if you respond to this question, uh, and then it's gonna, it'll, it'll be a nice uh, basis to move on to a, a, another aspect of this. The question is, do prosecutors gain anything? Are they rewarded in any way when they win cases? And 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 so basically, why do they do this? Why do they why do they extract this? Why do they use this bludgeon of the trial penalty? Um, you want to take a shot at that, Britain? You know that is a very multifaceted answer. Um, there are prosecutors who definitely have higher, different career goals than assistant United States attorney, whether that's United States attorney, whether that's political careers, we see it all the time where federal prosecutors transition into political careers. 
Um, as Sakira mentioned, we have this tough on crime approach that bleeds through the entire justice system. And so as prosecutors transition to political, their political aspirations, they have this tough on crime record behind them. Others, you know, I hate to call them bad apples because it's hard to have bad apples when the soil is rotten that the criminal justice system is built on. You know, we can say it's they're corrupting the system, but the system was corrupt. It was built corruptly. And so I think what we're seeing when it comes to prosecutors being just overzealous is just a multifaceted of things. It's ingrained in the culture of the United States Attorney's offices that they're in. They have political aspirations or aspirations for different offices. And so all of that is taken into account. And then when you're in a criminal justice system where your milestones, if you will, of success are convictions, then you're less incentivized to look at the moral aspect, to look at what was Chris Young's actual role in this offense. Why are we being so punitive? You know, and I think that, yeah, the prosecutors, some of them definitely have motives to transition to other careers and others, they are just doing what they were taught to do. So well, some people say that um, there really is no intent to punish. It's just that they're just doing their job and using the tools that are available to them, that there's nothing vindictive about it. Uh, Alexis, uh, who is our technician, I wonder if I could ask you to put up a letter that I'd like everyone to take a look at. Uh, and then I'll ask Clark, uh, to comment on this, if I, if I may. Can we put that letter up? And if we could just scroll down a little bit. This is a letter that was written to the United States Attorney in the Southern District of, uh, by the United States Attorney to the judge presiding in a case, um, uh, informing the, the judge that the government is uh, basically ready for trial. Um, uh, that uh, they do not presently intend to bring additional charges against uh, any except for one, one defendant. And then the last sentence is really something that I think viewers really need to see in black and white to understand just exactly what's going on. The government may, however, return to the grand jury to seek a superseding indictment, refining the charges, including by adding substantive narcotics distribution charges with respect to any defendant who proceeds to trial. Clark, um, what do you have to say about that? Well, listen, I mean, there's the system on a plate. Uh, there's a 1978 case, as you know very well, called Borden Kircher v. Hayes, where a defendant in Kentucky was charged with uh, check fraud. He was looking at two to 10 years the prosecutor offered him five years and advised him that if he did not take the five-year plea offer, the prosecutor would return to the grand jury and seek a new indictment, a superseding indictment in which he would be charged as a habitual felon, which would increase his exposure from 10 years to a, a, a mandatory life sentence. The uh, defendant Hayes turned down the plea offer, went to trial, was convicted and received a life sentence. This is just another version of that. It's communicating to a defendant that this is what we're going to do when we're feeling like we're in a good mood and we're feeling friendly and cooperative. But if you don't take that offer, we are going to uh, you know, drop the boot on you. And there's an element of this that I think is incredibly important to, to address. And that is, I, I think it's an open secret that when somebody turns down a plea offer and proceeds to trial, potentially a trial that, that involves an indictment where the prosecutor has gone back to the grand jury to add additional charges after the plea has been rejected, that's not really the prosecutor seeking individual justice. And Norm, as you pointed out earlier, we can, we can be pretty confident of that because they already made a plea offer based on the totality of the conduct that they were aware of. The reason for dropping the hammer the way they do is to make an example of that person, to show that if you exercise your right to trial in this country, you will be crucified if you lose that trial. That is to serve as an example to others to not gum up the system and slow things down by exercising their constitutional right to a trial or what one of my colleagues called uh, exercising your right to bespoke 
justice. This system is not about bespoke justice. This system is about racking up the maximum number of convictions that it can with the minimum investment of resources. And that kind of a letter serves uh, as a very clear message, not only to the defendants in that case, but to the defendants in every case that comes after it, what happens to people in America who exercise their right to trial and lose. And what happens is you get crucified in order to make an example of you. So uh, from a systemic standpoint, is there, isn't there a danger that by so loading up the power to coerce these pleas, uh, the government itself isn't even determining which cases uh, are worthy of, of prosecution and, 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 and in a sense, uh, using that, that lever so that they don't ever have to expose witnesses who may be flawed, may have a history of lying, you know, maybe uh, you know, law enforcement with uh, histories of misconduct um, uh, and, and, and things of that sort. Absolutely. And uh, just consider the fact that uh, the Department of Justice has had a number of high profile prosecutions that went to the Supreme Court, where it was determined that the conduct at issue, e even when there was no disagreement about what happened, they weren't relying on snitches and so forth. They just literally alleged that something was a crime that turned out not to be a crime. There was a case called Yates about a guy who threw some fish overboard when he got caught by a, a, a fish and wildlife inspector and they charged that as essentially destruction of documents under the Sarbanes-Oxley Act. He was looking at 20 years max and the Supreme Court tossed that out. There was another one called Bond where a woman tried to get back at her friend who had, who had stolen her husband by uh, putting some chemicals on a doorknob and a mailbox, and they charged her under the International Chemical Weapons Ban, and the Supreme Court tossed that one out. And then most famously, perhaps, is when the Supreme Court obtained a criminal conviction of Arthur Anderson, one of the big six accounting firms, destroyed the entire firm, put tens of thousands of people out of work, and then the Supreme Court threw that conviction out because the underlying conduct also was not criminal. So when you equip prosecutors to extract, I mean, think about it this way. If you've got a shaky case, uh, either because the facts are shaky or the law is shaky or both, the surest way to get a conviction is to cause, is to induce the defendant in that case to say in open court, I did it, I'm guilty, I committed a crime, let's proceed to sentencing. And that is the fantasy scenario for every prosecutor in our system. Don't make me prove this case in court, you will regret it. The best thing for both of us is if you stand up and tell that judge that you committed a crime. I want to shift our discussion. Thanks, Clark. I want to shift our discussion now and start to talk a little bit about potential solutions. Uh, but I do want to remind our viewers that uh, we're, we're ready to take questions. So uh, please send them along. And we're happy to, uh, uh, to interrupt our discussion to get to your questions, which are probably more important. Um, but what I want to focus on now as we try to think about fixing it, um, and it's really, uh, you know, I think it's a fascinating thing because you could say, well, it, it shouldn't be permissible uh, for prosecutors to have you know, a greater differential from the offer to what the charge is. But of course, one concern then is there won't be any offers. And with a, with a regime of mandatory minimums, um, they'll just use, they'll just use, every, they'll, just, they'll just lock everybody up for as long as possible. So I'm interested and um, I guess I'd like to start maybe uh, with Brittany. I'd like to hear two or three of your ideas. I'd like to hear from each of you some ideas for how to fix it. So I definitely have a couple. Um, using Krijan's case as an example, it's just an egregious example of what happens every day. One of them is to take the power from the prosecutors. Like there's no justification that in this Krijan's case, the prosecutor had more power than the judge. The judge who openly says he would have sentenced Christian to seven to eight years had to sentence Chris to die in prison. There's no parole in the federal system. Chris Young is said to die in prison. We're not going to sugarcoat that at all. But a judge wanted to give him seven to eight years. So you have a prosecutor with so much power that they're playing the role of the prosecutor, the judge, and in Chris Young's case, and many others, the executioner. So that's one of the first steps is the prosecutors have too much power. The A51 enhancements, there's zero oversight and that's problematic. There needs to be transformation as it relates to the A51 enhancement, which brings me to my next solution, which there has been a first step that is helpful in the A51 enhancement, but it has to be retroactive. 
The First Step Act rolled back the mandatory minimums as it relates to that 851 enhancement Chris Young was sentenced to life under. Today, neither of Chris Young's priors could be used to enhance his sentence because he did not go to prison for either of them. Meaning that if the First Step Act were retroactive, Chris Young would not be in prison right now at the height of coronavirus in a maximum security United States penitentiary. Chris Young is serving a life sentence today under yesterday's law. So another solution is we have to continue to push for, past the First Step Act, make several of those sentencing provisions retroactive and really change the law and transform the policies that allow Chris Young to be sentenced to life without parole against a federal judge's wishes in the first place. Thanks, Brittany. I wanna to turn to Secura and, and, and follow up on that because I know Leadership Conference is very active in trying to reform the laws. What is, what is the thinking that would, that would lead the, the Congress or any legislature for that matter to relax a sentence but not give somebody who's been serving that sentence for years the benefit of that. And why can't we break through on that issue? You know, um, Norma befuddles me as well. Um, having been someone who was a part of uh, those negotiations very intensely for over a year, um, and our organization, you know, was extremely, I mean, listen, the changes to A51 would not have been in that bill had we not stood up and said no. You know, there was an earlier version that didn't even have any sentencing reforms, let alone um, retroactivity. And so it is, it is, it's unconscionable that members of Congress don't understand that you should not continue to punish someone once we've decided that a law is unjust, right? It just, it took back to Clark's morality question. I mean, it's immoral. It's immoral to leave people languishing in prison once we've said, actually we've made a mistake. And so we, we are fixing our mistake and everybody um, who is currently serving time under this mistake should have the benefit. And that is something that we continue to push on um, in that regard. And, and I think we have to appeal, appeal more to um, people's uh, good common sense and morality. And also we have to educate the public because what I don't think we've often done is make even though majority of Americans, at least in polls that I've seen, support the elimination of mandatory minimums, which I think is one of the solutions to uh, dealing with the trial penalty, removing the tool in the prosecutorial tool belt to be able to hold these lengthy sentences and these enhancements over people's heads. Um, the majority of uh, Americans support elimination of mandatory minimums. Um, unfortunately, uh, you know, voters aren't always as educated when it comes to who they are voting for and who also is in line with their beliefs and their values. And I think that's on our part to, to continue to educate people in that regard. So I want to thank, thank you, Secure. I want to uh, note that uh, a number of our viewers have said uh, or have expressed the view that they have loved ones who uh, have suffered from this. And I take, the, I take that to be both, they're either, they've been sentenced uh, after trial to a horribly a greater sentence or they pled guilty probably thinking they might have actually been innocent or were innocent, but felt they were compelled to do so. I, so I want to acknowledge that, that we're seeing that from a, a number of the, uh, the comments. Uh, and we do have a, I do want to, I want to throw this question uh, maybe your way, Clark, if, if I may. Uh, and it's this, um, um, how do we go about, how, what is it gonna take to abolish mandatory minimums? Uh, not just federally, but in the states. And I will also ask you in thinking about that, because I, you know, I know that FAM has been thinking about this, NACDL has as well, that whether or not one route to take with some of this um, is to just have some sort of legislation that allows people to get a second look at their sentence at some point down the road. I mean, if, if the political lift of getting rid of mandatory minimum is too great, what about saying that, you know, if you've served five years or 10 years, you get to go back to a judge to see, you know, how you're doing. And maybe you can, maybe this, maybe, maybe the sentence was so dramatically uh, disproportionate that it could be fixed. Norm, I'm, I'm going to apologize in advance and I'm going to do something that us litigators hate. I'm going to, I'm going to, as a witness, I'm going to resist the question. Um, 
I uh, frankly don't put a lot of stock in legislative solutions. I think that the law enforcement lobby is the second or third strongest in the country. I think there are very few issues that prosecutors are more committed to than ensuring uh, that they can extract uh, confession or uh, guilty pleas as efficiently and with as little trouble as possible. And so I'm, I, I, well, I think all of those things would be wonderful. I am skeptical uh, whether they, they can be achieved. And uh, I wanna answer a question that, that maybe is, is the second level up that we've already talked about a little bit. What are some solutions? I never wanna be in a room where I'm not proposing the most radical solution to a problem like this. So I'm gonna share, share mine with you. What if, I, what, what if there were a wonderful 10 or 12 minute explainer video, like a short version of this film um, with like Hollywood celebrities. Imagine it's narrated by Morgan Freeman and Kim Kardashian's in it, and so's Oprah, uh, and maybe Jay-Z, and everybody wants to see this video. What if I could, and, and it tells the whole story. This is how the system is rotten. This is how it coerces people into pleading guilty. This is how it doesn't want you to know what's going on. And it railroads people, particularly people of color, into unjust sentences. And it tells them the number one thing you can do to prevent that is by getting on a jury and refusing to convict somebody unless the prosecutor has persuaded you not only that the person is factually guilty, but that the punishment they are going to inflict is a morally just punishment. And if they haven't persuaded you of both of those things, then you vote to acquit. Now imagine if you as a criminal defense attorney could be assured by me, an activist, that the next time one of your clients goes to trial, every single person sitting in that veneer pool every potential juror will have seen that video in the last two hours. Imagine how that might change your decision about what kind of a plea offer to, uh, to entertain and when to go to trial and whether to go to trial. And I'll tell you what, I'm not just thinking about it. Well, thank you. That's a very provocative thought. Uh, uh, Brittany, uh, you, wanna, you wanna react to that. What do you think about that? Very provocative, I like it because we have to revolt and be revolutionary in our thought process as we work to transform the system. I, I'm even getting allergic to the word reform. We have to transform the system. There has to be a revolution. So Clark, I think I, I love it. I love the radical solutions. And one of the reasons, you know, in all sincerity is it's just what we're doing is just not working. We have these tinkering reforms of the system. And yeah, you know, we're helping, the bills are helping to release 5,000, 7,000 people. But what are we really doing when there's other bills in place or there's other mechanisms in place that are allowing 10,000 more to enter the system? From the, so it's, you know, I, I struggle with that. And one of the things that I'm always trying to center is just the human element and the heartbeats behind the numbers. My mom was in prison. I know firsthand what it's like to have a family member in prison, how it devastates communities and families. And some of the most brilliant people I've ever met in my entire life have been my clients. And so as we, whether we're pushing for, for legislation or more radical reforms, you know, in line with Clark, we have to keep people at the center. And one of the reasons, as I say in the, the film, why Chris resonates so much with me and many of my clients is because they could be my cousin, my friend, my family member. I see myself in them, you know, and we just have to be sure we're keeping the humanization part center as we go through whatever solutions we're gonna, we're gonna set forth. Well, one of the virtues of being uh, probably the uh, oldest member of this group uh, is that uh, I uh, practiced criminal defense before the sentencing guidelines came into effect, the federal sentencing guidelines, which uh, I think many of us, many of those who are viewing know that they were absolutely mandatory guidelines for a long time. Uh, that's apart from mandatory minimums. Um, but one thing that I think we should be thinking about, and um, I would hope people can rally around, is a return to the era when judges actually could be judges. Now, I, there was a movement, there was a, you know, there were those, uh, some people who started a movement because some judges were, uh, were perceived as being too lenient. There were probably some that were too harsh. But overall, uh, before we had this rigid 
sentencing scheme. And it's pretty much been inflicted on the states as a result of various legislation that tied money for prisons um, to uh, having uh, guidelines or mandatory minimums of uh, doing away with parole. One of the things that you could do back, back in those days was you could actually humanize your client. And I, for one, will never forget, I had a second time offender in federal court, but the first time around, it was just, you know, he had gone through the process. You know, the, it, it, there hadn't been a real, it, no one had really looked into his background. When I got him, the second case, uh, you know, several years later, and we did a, you know, we were able to, to learn a lot about his childhood, about the, the deprivation, about some of the abusive things that had happened to him. And actually, that federal judge, who was a very harsh sentencer, gave him a much lesser sentence than he got the first time. That's something like justice. And so I am a big believer that we have to find a way to break through the mandatory minimums. Uh, I, I, I love Clark's idea. I play with it in my head. He's been sharing it with me for a long time. I do worry though, there are people that practice in jury sentencing states and juries can be harsh as well. And so it's just something to keep in mind. Um, but the but but the idea that we need to rehabilitate the role of the public in the criminal justice system, and frankly the role of the courts, because one of the things that's happening as a result of this this bludgeon is with people giving up all these rights, nothing gets litigated. If nothing gets litigated on the trial level, it doesn't go up on the appellate level. So when we were talking earlier with Secura about we're not getting motions to suppress from bad cops making bad stops, right? And we, you had that also, Brittany, uh, with Chris Young's case. We're not getting courts to decrying that kind of conduct, so we're losing out on a whole lot of other a whole lot of other things. I do have another question here that I want to throw out there, um, and I'll let any one of you just signal me if you want to take it. Uh, you know, NACDL just recently uh, released a report on the reopening of courts uh, after the or in the wake or while we're still going through the the uh, COVID nineteen virus and. Essentially, what we have concluded based on uh, epidemiologists, infectious disease specialists, surveys that have been done of potential jury pools is that it's probably not a good idea to have jury trials while this is still a factor because a lot of people uh, could get sick and die. People are afraid to come to court. Um, the idea of using a virtual way of conducting a trial is antithetical to the constitution. But the but the one of the one of the viewers has asked this question: um, What effect will the virus have uh, on uh, on plea bargaining? And is this going to be yet another uh, lever to extract pleas from people who may not be in a position to wait until it's over? I, I'm going to answer that question um, just really briefly, and Secure and Clark can can piggyback. But I want to tie it to Chris Young. So we have won a very rare shot at post-sentencing habeas petition for Chris Young. And the judge has granted us an evidentiary hearing in his case in a what's called a 2255 habeas. Very rare that this even happens, I'm sure you all know. And we've, it was supposed to be in May and it's gotten pushed back and pushed back and now it's in December, but we still don't know how the courts are gonna be operating in December. And we, this is literally Chris Young's last bite at the apple. We don't wanna risk going to court under coronavirus guidelines with his life on the line. We wanna see witnesses' faces. We don't want them behind masks. You know, there's, there's a lot more to it. You know, of course you have jurors who may not want the, the social distancing aspect, they may not want to come in, but you also have just nuances of trial with witness posture and their facial expressions, like I said, and the judge just being able to take all of that in. It's a very good question for sure, as it relates to plea deals as well, because people could be much more incentivized to take pleas when they weigh the options with their lawyers of face masks for one, which is what we're dealing with in John's case. Thank you, Brittany. We've got a couple more minutes left and I'd like to give uh, both Secure and Clark an opportunity either to comment on that or just to 
share some uh, concluding thoughts. Uh, Sakira? Thanks, Norm. Um, <clears throat> I just want to say, you know, I think one, this conversation is, is comes at a timely, in a timely manner and um, has, I think, illuminated, hopefully for all of the viewers, just the pervasive ways in which the criminal legal system continues to undermine the, the promise of the constitution of equality and justice under law for everyone. Um, and as Brittany said, you know, we have moved away from reform. <laughs> um, reform is, I think, we are beyond reform. If we keep reforming, um, it'll be, you know, 50 years before we absolutely end mass incarceration. And um, these types of issues are those that contribute to mass incarceration. And so we have to be bold, we have to be visionary, we have to be um, radical um, and come up with crazy ideas that might be crazy right now, but absolutely might lend, uh, lead us to the type of transformation and change that we ultimately want to see. So we are with you all and um, are, are here for the long haul. Well, this is certainly our moment. So thank you, Sakira. And we're gonna, we have to seize this moment. Clark, I'm gonna give you a, a, a last opportunity to jump in here. My final thought is this, uh, the, the criminal justice system described and prescribed in the text of the constitution is one to be proud of. It's one that reflects ideals and values and convictions about what due process means that were um, uh, developed over a period of many centuries uh, and drew from many traditions and distilled the very essence of what a just system is. But that's the one that is described in the constitution. The one that we operate in real life is a system to be ashamed of. It's a system to be offended by. As a citizen, I am deeply offended by the prospect that prosecutors go in front of a judge and purport to do the things they do in my name because you are not doing it in my name. You are not threatening people's family members uh, with indictment gratuitously simply to leverage a plea in my name. And you are not threatening people with a trial penalty in my name. And it offends me deeply. Uh, that prosecutors go into court and purport to speak to me because I am ashamed of this system. And it is an affront uh, to the constitution and to the centuries uh, of enlightened uh, you know, thought about what a just system really looks like. So we have two criminal justice systems in this, in this country. There's the one that's described in the text of the constitution and mythologized to school children. And there's the one we operate to make sure that we are the world's leading incarcerator of human beings um, by percentage of population. I'm deeply ashamed of that fact. And we need to go back to a just criminal justice system, one that deserves the name because ours sure doesn't. Thanks so much, Clark. Um, I wanna ask uh, Alexis, if you just put up that one slide, I wanna tell the viewers about a couple of things that they can look at. Uh, but before I do that, I wanna thank, again, I wanna thank FAM for their efforts on this tremendous uh, film uh, and Kevin for his uh, courage and support and this magnificent panel. You're also uh, passionate and enthusiastic at that it's, it is hard not to feel a little bit of optimism uh, when I listen to all of you speak about this problem and your dedication to fixing it. Um, on the screen right now for you just is our links uh, where you can go to see um, the report that NACDL did, which really profiles a lot of cases and tells uh, at, at, on the federal level, uh, the story of the trial penalty. Uh, we're working with affiliates now to expose it and reform it on the state level as well. And then also a publication called the Federal Sentencing Reporter put out, they invited us actually to co-edit an issue. And we had so much interest from so many different perspectives uh, that it ended up being a double issue. There are a lot of great articles in there. Uh, Clark has one of them where he talks uh, at length about his idea about how to get juries more involved. Um, there's an article from uh, there's an article from from FAM uh, and 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 really groups from the from the left and the right, the ACLU, the Texas Public Policy Foundation, Right on Crime, uh, Cato, of course, Clark's organization, uh, Human Rights Watch, um, the Charles Koch Institute, Fair Trials International. This is an issue. I tell you, this is an issue on which we will make progress because this offends people to the core. And the, the, the will to fix it is coming from across the political spectrum. So we will, we will make sure that the trial does not vanish. Thank you all very much. Stay with the fight. <laughs>